What is Marxism, really? Depending on who you ask, you will get a range of different answers, ranging from the complete and utter annihilation of the human species in every conceivable regard, or the solution to every possible problem that could appear in the physical reality that we occupy. I would argue it's probably neither of these things, but both Marxist and anti-Marxist schools of thought often have very different and seemingly just completely disparate ideas as to what Marxism even is. And just to be clear, I'm not a, any sort of communist. Maybe I am some sort of socialist. I just, I don't like political labels. I don't like ideology. I do like ideas though, and I do think that people should be able to make up their own mind about shit. And I mean to tell you that there is a core concept, a core premise, a central idea to Marxism from which all of the other ideas in a very roundabout way derive. Sometimes that way is so roundabout that you will go, how, how did you, like, what steps are in between this and that? But there is a central idea. And frankly, even if you call yourself a leftist, there is a good to fair chance that you do not know what this central idea is, because leftism is fucking mired in ideology. And the people who do know about this, if they accept it as such, are not very forthcoming about the central idea of their ideology, instead preferring to just shout, work is exploitation without ever explaining what the fuck that actually means. And while there's a huge amount of, of conflict, really, uh, on the ideas that are derived from the core statement, like, you know, absolute power of government, a lot of Marxists, ooh, very, very much not on board with that shit. Everyone who's actually read Das Kapital pretty much agrees on this. Workers should be paid out the money that they are owed. Now let's dig into this a little bit because it's not about wage theft, which is a huge issue that is somehow related to this in some way, but it's not relevant to today. In a capitalist society, you have a certain skill set and time that you sell to an employer to make money. Under ideal conditions, which, let's be honest, are never really the case, but this is a theoretical example, so let's just roll with it, uh, your employer will give you a certain amount of money that was agreed upon beforehand for a certain amount of work. That's the transaction. You give your boss labor and you receive currency in return. Now, Marxism describes this sort of relationship as inherently exploitative. Why? Well, there's actually a very fundamental business truth uh, to this that, I mean, pretty much everyone knows this. In order for your boss to employ you and keep you employed, you need to make your boss more money than your boss pays you. Having you on board needs to be profitable. It needs to generate a profit for the company. Labor, for pretty much any sort of corporation, tends to be the greatest individual cost, often the greatest cost overall. So they will try to keep this profit margin that they make on each individual employee as wide as possible. Now, of course, this isn't in like real conditions. You can't really ascertain how much a worker actually contributes to the company because of it's all complicated. But this again is a theoretical exercise where we're assuming ideal hypothetical conditions. But this margin of money you are paid versus money you generate for the company is what Marxism is concerned with. Marxism posits that actually because you generated that money with your labor, that profit margin should be yours. You made that money and therefore you should receive it. By definition, you are not being paid the value you contributed to the economy through your labor. Your boss took a cut from that and your boss did not earn that cut because that was your labor. And the reason your boss is able to get away with taking that cut that your boss did not earn is because your boss owns the means of production. Your boss owns the company or, you know, the partners do if it's a private equity firm with multiple owners. If it's a publicly traded corporation, it's the shareholders who own the company and govern its operations through the board of directors. And the goal of any corporation is to generate profit for its shareholders. Owners who, especially in large corporations, tend to have never even contributed any labor 
to that corporation. Usually, what they contributed was money, although if a, a company is traded on the stock market, it is entirely possible for you, if you have a lot of cash on hand, to buy a controlling stake in a company that you have never put any money into. You just bought those shares from other people who have purchased them from other people who ultimately purchased them from the company. But you have to have been rich to do this. You had to have the money to begin with. And now comes the point where if you think about it, it's kind of fucked up. So imagine this, right? You want to start a business. Maybe you want to sell lemonade. Now in order to do this, you need water, sugar, juicing equipment, lemons, very importantly, containers to bottle the lemons into. As the business grows, you might need, you know, more workers, real estate for like a bottling plant or sales areas. You need more raw materials to do your stuff with. Maybe you will be paying food scientists to do things for you. You might need an accounting department. These things don't just appear out of thin air. You have to acquire them somehow. And in order to acquire them, you need starting capital. And you also need the ability to sustain unprofitable operations for an extended period of time because usually the first few years of any corporation are not profitable. Now you could get a loan and Marxists say this is a better idea. You get a certain amount of money from a bank or a credit union. If you're a small business, you should definitely try a credit union because you know, credit unions are better for small business. You get the loan, you buy the things, you run the company, and then with future profits earned, because of course the bank and credit union checked, hey, look at this, this is a thing, and this is a good business plan, and we believe in this venture, and then you eventually pay back the loan with interest. Now imagine instead of that, this happens, right? Somebody shows up, says, look, I'm just gonna give you a bunch of money with which to start or expand your company, but here's the deal. In exchange for this, I will own part of your company in perpetuity. It doesn't matter if the money is paid back with interest, if the money is paid back a hundredfold, a thousandfold, a trillionfold. The rich person will forever receive profit from your company because they had the money earlier in time to invest in it. Marxism argues that in this case, they receive way more from the company than they actually contributed to the company in any meaningful way, in this particular way, in the form of a capital investment. And especially because it means that this money will have to come from somewhere, Marxism argues that this is not just. What they put in and what they got out is not proportional. But the bigger you go with business, the more standard practice this becomes. And the reason for this is that the people who do this are immensely powerful. They can deprive you of options on a systemic level to such an extreme extent that the only option you have left is to make this deal with the devil. Which which is pretty much exactly what this is. It's a very well-known mafia tactic. Oh, I see your pizza place caught on fire because somebody firebombed it and now you have to close it down. Well, how about I, how about I give you like $5,000 and you're gonna have to pay me back forever and ever and ever and ever, and ever whatever happens. This does not tend to be the kind of situation where you can just say no to these people because there is no such thing as a free market. You say no to these people and your business will be annihilated. In the time in which Marxism was born, most of the people who were in this position of power were old money aristocrats, the kind of people who were descended of noble families who in medieval feudalist times extracted this value from their serfs that lived on their land. At that point in time, the excuse was, well, we are the chosen of God, the nobility, we are born born into a better position than you look. We serve the king. Are you going to argue with the king? Also, we have men with swords. And if you look at the economic realities that we have in the world, even in the United States of America, this is very much still the case. The factory owner is no longer the second Earl of Sogma, Lord Ligma Baldsley, but it's still rich people who come from old money and were born rich. That is the majority of these people. It's just aristocrats 
whose entire job in life is to extract surplus value from workers by forcing companies into these devilish deals. And because Marxists recognize that, you know, we live in a society, workers don't really have the option of opting out of this system. You need to feed your family, build as good a future as possible for your kids. And you just have to, as an individual, pragmatically deal with the issues the system presents you with in order to achieve these things. The people who are creating this system are so immensely powerful that you need to exist in their system in order to exist at all. And you also need to exist in their system in order to enact any sort of meaningful change to the system at all, which is especially difficult because, of course, the system will always attempt self-preservation. This is why they came up with unions. The powerful aristocrats understand that they have a class interest and therefore will do things in a way that can extract the maximum amount of surplus value from workers because if workers have less money, they are less powerful they are more dependent upon you. But if these workers now band together, the other side of this agreement is actually realized where they can withhold labor in order to exercise some form of power to counterbalance the immense power of money. It is an effort to reclaim some of this surplus value that, in Marxist terms, was stolen from you by powerful people. Now, we have a problem what is the solution? Well, the solution here is that instead of the aristocrats and the investors owning the company, the workers are the people who own the company. This is what Marxists mean when they say that the workers should own the means of production. The steel worker is no longer breaking his back so that some dandy in a polo shirt who was born in a castle can make more money that he can't even account for. The profits of the corporation get paid out to the workers workers of that corporation. This is achieved through everyone who works at the company owning a certain share in that company. You can think of it as a private equity firm where everyone is a partner. Now what exactly the distribution for this would be, there are many different models and many different specific implementations for this. There is no one blanket solution. This is where Marxism, you know, it spreads out into various different areas. And this sort of idea is also realized in various other non-Marxist ideologies. Some people say that the profits should be distributed equally. Others say that there should be various different tiers of, you know, how much of the percentage of the share an individual worker gets because some workers contribute more to the success of the company than others. This is, by the way, how pirate ships used to operate. Uh, ships were not owned by captains, but by the crews of those ships. They would, from among their ranks, uh, elect a captain and sometimes also other positions like the quartermaster, and then those people would be in charge in battle situations, but everything else would be democratic. And often those people, captains and also specialized positions like navigators would get a greater share of the loot. Some people say that laborers should get their wages and then also part of the profits, which is personally how I think it should be done. Others say it should only be the profits and they shouldn't get a wage, in which case, you know, you no longer have labor costs to worry about, so those ultimately the profits will be much bigger. I've made a video on worker-owned co-ops. Uh, it's a perfectly viable and real-world existing business model that we have. It's just not the standard business model because it's not something that wealthy aristocrats can leech money off of. Here's where it gets interesting, though. I, uh, I, I decided to play around a little bit. It was late at night and I thought, hmm, this could be an interesting addition to the video. And uh, thought about looking into what it would look like if major United States corporations were worker-owned cooperatives. Now bear in mind here for these calculations, they're also a purely theoretical exercise because when a company is a worker-owned co-op, uh, it has certain structural changes that go on with it because the incentive structure inside of the corporation is less biased toward exploiting its workers, so numbers would look a bit different. Wages and labor conditions would increase across the board, driving up labor costs, but also the amount of money that individual laborers get paid. Also, executives would tend to get paid less because there are certain brackets, which is in most co-ops that exist around the world, at least the bigger ones, like for instance, Mondragon, these bracketed tiers are how profit distribution is done, where, for instance, uh, in Mondragon, which is, uh, you know, a confederacy of various different co-ops that started out making, I think, like, heaters, they manufactured heaters, 
Uh, the way that it works is that a manager, on average, earns five times the amount that the lowest paid employee within that specific unit of the uh, corporation does. But also the lowest paid employee gets a lot higher wages than tends to be the case in comparable industries. And the way that this distribution works is determined on a regular basis by a democratic process. I didn't account for these things because it, it's not possible to really account for these things without making like a really far-fetched analysis for which I am not qualified. So with the numbers that I am about to give you, Realistically, they're probably going to be a bit higher for the individual worker if you account for all of the factors that they also make more money in wages. Okay, so at the end of any given accounting period, there is something called net income. Net income is what is left at the end in terms of profits. At this point, all variable and fixed costs have been paid, like labor, material, energy, real estate, whatever the fuck. You have repaid your loans that you had to repay for the loan payments that you make, because those are agreed upon, obviously. Even the tax man has come by to collect his share. This net income is then usually distributed to shareholders, although sometimes some some part of it is retained in order to finance future, uh, you know, expansions of the company without having to take on new loans. Or, you know, investments. But if you retain income too much, your shareholders will become very angry with you and will depose you as CEO, as they can do because they form the board of directors. So let's start with a big one. Walmart. In the fiscal year 2020, uh, the Walmart Corporation made $14.88 billion in net income. Most of this money was paid out to members of the Walton family for the great achievement and contribution of being a member of the Walton family. Walmart employs 2.6 million people worldwide, 1.6 million of which are located within the United States. If instead, these profits had been distributed to the workers of the corporation, assuming an equal distribution of shares, every single individual person of those 2.6 million employees of Walmart would have made, in the year 2020, 5,700 and fuck. 5,723 US dollars. I was so close. I almost had it, but Dyscalculia once again just... This is in addition to wages they already collected, right? So I would like you to picture how much in the year 2020 the average Walmart employee would have needed, would have been able to make use of those $5,723, yes. Amazon, in the same fiscal year, had a net income of 21.33 billion US dollars. Amazon also has 1.3 million employees. If that money had been distributed in that same way, every single employee of Amazon would have had an additional $16,407. Even if half of that money had been retained for future expansions of the company, we would still have 8000 more than $8,000 per person. That is a hell of a Christmas bonus. Instead, the overwhelming majority of that money just sort of went to Jeff Bezos. FedEx, who kept the US running through the uh, last year, made a whopping 2.49 billion US dollars, which is not quite as much as Amazon, but it's still a pretty chunk of change. I'm just gonna read it off the tablet now because I'm tired of getting it wrong. <laughs> it's fucking hate not being able to remember numbers. Divided by its 398,500 employees, that is $6,392 per person. Here's the one that really killed me when I looked into it though. And you should, I want, you should sit down for this one because this one is wild. Amazon in the fiscal year 2020 made 57.41 billion dollars in net income. Amazon also has 137,000 employees. Get ready for this, that's almost 420,000 dollars for every single employee. Even if you retained three quarters of this, every single Apple employee would still be making a six 
figure salary. And these are incredible numbers because they are numbers that billionaires do not want you to know. Whenever you hear them say, oh no, we would go under if we had to pay our employees more, know that this amount of more, the precise amount calculated, is uh, over $16,000 a year. But of course they can't pay those people more because that money is earmarked for people who didn't earn it. Now you can say, well Jeff Bezos, he founded that company, he took such a risk, he, he, he had such great leadership, and the company went so far because of his contributions, and yes, I think you would be right saying that, and I think Jeff Bezos should be a very rich man, which he still could be under a cooperative model. But the reason he became this rich, a billionaire, you, no matter where you are in society, are closer to a millionaire, even most kinds of multi-millionaire, than a billionaire like Je You are closer to a billionaire than you are to Jeff Bezos with his, like, over a hundred billion dollars. The reason he has that is because he got lucky. He happened to found a corporation that just so happened to become unbelievably successful to an unprecedented degree. This isn't simply because he was good at what he did. This is not how reality works. Jeff Bezos isn't billions of times better at managing a corporation than somebody who works at Amazon is at packing boxes. Or frankly, than a surgeon is at doing surgery. If you find 50 bucks in the street, you got lucky. You didn't earn those 50 bucks. And it's the same with the overwhelming majority of wealthy investors. They were born into wealth. This is not their achievement, this is them getting lucky in life. And because they already had this unfathomable amount of money, they were simply able to buy more lottery tickets to win big. And winning in this case means making an unfathomable amount of money that you could never ever possibly spend. These people have rockets, they're going to space and not, it's not even making a dent in their balancing sheets. They're able to do it by underpaying their laborers. There's also an argument uh, for this sort of Marxist theory uh, from a macroeconomics perspective. There is a concept called the velocity of money. It's a very common, it's like probably like first semester economics class at college. Fundamentally, it's the idea that not every dollar is created equal in terms of how much it contributes to the economy. That's because dollars, and or any other kind of currency, are a means to facilitate transactions of goods and services. A dollar you pay your plumber to fix your toilet is a dollar that that plumber will then spend on, say, buying groceries, and then the supermarket will use that dollar to pay the cashier, who will use that dollar to buy school books for her children. The school book publisher uses this money to buy paper, the paper manufacturer uses that money to buy a new paper pressing machine, I don't know how paper manufacturing works, but one of those. And the people who produce that use that dollar to buy steel, and the guy at the steel mill uses that dollar to pay the night security guard, who makes sure that no kids are climbing around the steel mill at night, and that night security guard then goes to the supermarket, spends the dollar on groceries, and so on and so on. You get the idea. If instead you put this dollar into the bank account of a rich billionaire, that is where it will remain. There are only so many luxury yachts you can buy and only so much caviar that you can eat. In fact, chances are that that dollar will go into one of these deal with the devil type investment scenarios called venture capital, where a young entrepreneur gets chained to one of these billionaires because one of these billionaires just happened to have money at an earlier point in time. This dollar now goes to furthering this perpetual cycle of venture capital and it actually ends up slowing down the economy because it makes sure that people who would actually spend that money on things get fewer dollars. As a rule of thumb, the less money someone has, the more likely they are at spending any given amount of money that they receive on necessities. 
The lower you start out with injecting money into the economy, the higher the velocity of that money will be because it will facilitate more transactions. The more money regular people have, the healthier the economy. And we know this because it used to be this way in many places, and back then, the economy was healthier. But then the aristocrats reared their head and decided that they should get even more money than the unfathomable amounts that they already had. This is why banks get bailouts and not people, even though when that happens, many of those dollars will actually have such a low velocity that they will end up slowing down the economy because they have so much money that they can crash everything and profit from it. The aristocrats control the means of production. This is why they get to leech money from regular working people pretty much without repercussions. Because that's the way it's been for thousands of years under feudalism. And this remnant of feudalism is, on a societal level, the most urgent thing that Marxism seeks to eliminate. Because Marxism is not a big fan of feudalism. And that is the core premise of Marxism. Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. So to supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, because I also have to operate within the system, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, I hope you, you know, think about this uh, in some way, shape or form, because most people have grown up with this lie that the way that things are uh, is just the way that things are in nature when really they are not. It is a constructed reality and there is an active disinformation campaign to make sure that you don't find out about alternatives in terms of economics. And also, let's be very, very clear about this. Once again, I love saying this, leftists are shit at actually telling people about these things. And see you around, cunts.